not, not in a public speaking context, so forgive me. Uh, David Cabianca is currently an associate professor at York University in Toronto, Canada. He has taught typography, history and theory at CalArts, OCAD, and both architecture studio and theory and criticism at the University of Manitoba and the University of Michigan, along with his Cranbrook Academy of Art MFA in 2D Design. He holds a Master of Architecture degree from Princeton University and a Master of Arts degree from the University of Reading and London College of Communication. His scholarly interests to date uh, have to date focused on typeface design, contemporary graphic design, and sites of disciplinary conflict. In 2014, his typeface Cardio was released by the Emigre Type Foundry. Okay, so on Academy Day, I uh, gave a brief intro to our department and to our year, and I outlined, during that, during that uh, five-minute intro, I outlined a plan for debar departmental activity that included, or that includes language, typographic, and critical thinking training. Uh, David is a guest critic in our department. Um, he'll be spending the entire year <clears throat> with the 2D department. I've asked David to serve in this capacity for a very simple reason. Not only is he technically skilled, capable of producing beautiful and compelling work, and this is a very, very important point. So he is a actual practitioner capable of producing beautiful and compelling work. He's also a powerful teacher He's been a conduit through which a number of really fabulous uh, students uh, in our department um, have uh, passed through him. However, uh, an arrow through the heart of the matter is my absolute belief that his contribution to the department formally and technically this year will be eclipsed uh, only by his intellectual contributions. David is a, a wickedly smart designer, and um, I'm, I'm very proud, and the institution's very proud to claim him as an alumnus, and I'm excited to share him with the community this evening. David. <clears throat> um, thank you, Elliot. Um, uh, I'm sure you've heard the usual uh, comments. I, I'm a really nervous public speaker, and I, I am so nervous that I tend to um, I write down my talk. So I'll try and make it seem like I'm not reading from a script, but um, if I didn't, I would be frozen in fear because it's Cranbrook. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and also the other thing is I just want to, uh, I mentioned that I'm trying something I've never done before. It's a topic that rather than talk to you about my um, f uh, physical work or, or design work, I'm actually going to talk to you about um, the th thought process that structures why I do what I do. Um, so it's, it's, it's all about me um, all the time. Um, so hopefully you um, enjoy it or not. Um, okay. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to speak tonight and for the opportunity to work with the 2D design students. It's very much an honor. I must say, as much as I'm nervous about speaking in front of you today, I think the most nervous person in the room is probably Elliot. Uh, Cranbrook's a very special place. Students essentially work with one person, the artist in residence, and that learning relationship relies upon a lot of trust in order to be effective. So Elliot is placing a lot of faith in me because he's extending his trust, the trust his students have in him to include me. And I hope I can do justice to the generosity he's extended on my behalf. So let me begin. I came to Cranbrook having already earned a master's degree in architecture at Princeton University. The 2D design program has always piqued my interest since I discovered Rick Pointer's uh, first Typography Now book uh, and read the names of the schools associated with the coolest work. 13 years post Cranbrook and two additional master's degrees later, this talk will forge some sense of the landscape that forms my background I call graphic design. Relative to its small alumni base, 
Cranbrook has had an outsized role in forming the discourse of graphic design, which is to say that Cranbrook has helped shape the history of graphic design. And Cranbrook has done so in part due to its non-conventional learning environment. There are no official classes, professors, or artists in residence, of which there's only one per department. And I, I know you guys all know this, and I'm just repeating what you know, but I'm, I'm getting there. Um, there's only one per department, and the majority of students live on campus with full access to their studios 24-7. But perhaps most importantly, client work is discouraged. Students pursue personal insights which shape their careers. The rest of us are just along for the ride. It's that learning environment which contributes to the kind of work which is produced. It is that learning environment that produces a structure of how Cranbrook students think. If you don't believe me, try explaining your non Cranbrook, sorry, try explaining to your non Cranbrook college friends what your life is like here. They'll think you're nuts. But a Cranbrook education does make a difference. If that were not the case, its place in history would not be so well regarded, and alumni wouldn't be leading in leading positions relative to their field. And that goes across the board as far as I'm concerned, as far as uh, sculpture, painting, uh, metal smithing, um, fiber, photography, uh, ceramics, uh, and print media, or media, I should say. Um, when I was here, it was called print media. Um, but Cranbrook is just one piece that makes up my own educational experience. In a lot of ways, Cranbrook and Princeton are diametrically opposed. Cranbrook is all about a rigor of making, while Princeton is all about a rigor in language. But that's just really a glib surface interpretation. Both institutions are in fact engaged in a practice of telling stories or creating narratives with objects. Narratives are something that we use to communicate ideas. We create narratives using both forms and language. And they're as much a design project as the visual images that we are accustomed to think of as the standard fare of graphic design production. So what does that mean for the graphic designer sitting in the audience? Maybe not, maybe, maybe a lot, maybe not much. This is something that turns my crank and I don't feel the need to impose my view on others to see graphic design this way. But if you'll indulge me for 60 minutes, I'll try to make my time worthwhile. So I'll lay out what I find interesting and hopefully a few of you will as well. My interests are not the same as the overly invoked cliche and mostly misunderstood designer as author. My position on authorship isn't about writing or making, it's about seeing. Choosing to see, how to see, and how to express how to see. Making, writing, and criticism flow out of the ability to see. And I place criticism in a separate category uh, of practice because it is. It operates on the world as it is, and it also brings something new into the world. But criticism requires a different way to approach the world. I don't go looking for a fight when I'm engaged in criticism, but I do when I'm making or writing. I came to graphic design rather late, uh, but not by choice. My initial education in architecture was a result of being rejected from the one undergraduate graphic design program I applied to. And I just dug these up, and I, uh, these have not seen the light of day in 27 years. Uh, this is from my high school uh, portfolio. These are uh, chalk pastels that, you know, from my, my application portfolio that got rejected, and then two watercolors that got part of that same portfolio. I have no idea why I got rejected, but what the hell. Um, it was not until I completed an undergraduate degree in architecture, entered one master's program before going on to complete my master's degree in architecture at another school, that I made the switch to formally study graphic design. So how did my architecture education influence me? I can't speak for every architecture student, but for me, architecture is a way of thinking, one that influences an approach to seeing. My education taught me that architecture is an attitude, and architecture is not a look. I don't automatically put things in grids. I don't make things that look like buildings or rectangles or whatever that means. So I've got five points to make, basically. Uh, first point, functions not what, not, sorry, function may not be what you think it is. So here's an example of what an arch architecture education means to me. In my final year as an undergraduate in my undergraduate degree, we're given two seemingly incongruent artifacts, a map of the area of Spitalfields in London. This is the map here. And a, uh, it's the same area where Jack the Ripper was active. Um, that's just a close-up of, of the church that's on the map. Uh, that's Christ Church by Nicholas Hawksmoor. Um, and we're given a map of the Palace of Knossos, which is uh, the, pa the palace of the king responsible for creating the labyrinth that, that held the Minotaur. 
So what do these two things have to do with each other? The answer is nothing or simultaneously as much as you want them to meet to each other. In both instances, you're dealing with physical realities and fantastical myths. Or in the case of Jack the Ripper, a kind of mythology that's developed around a series of unsolved grisly murders. In both instances, these mythologies are passed down to us via language. Something as flimsy as language, something without physical presence, has the ability to influence how we shape our practices. In turn, we shape our physical spaces. In these examples of a church or a creature such as the Minotaur, there's no proof or validation by the function, as it were. The forms of a church or a labyrinth are created to satisfy some inner desire that we have as societies, sorry, that we have as, in, as individuals and as a society. Their rightness, in big quotation marks, of their forms is hardly related to how well a god or a beast thinks they're being adequately served. No god's telling us, you know what, that church for 2,000 years, just, it ain't working for me. <clears throat> Yet they apparently served their purpose. They functioned as needed, which begs the question about where do we draw the line between the functions that satisfy the necessities needed for existence and those functions that, ne that satisfy necessities to live. Point number two, pursue questions that can't be answered. Function is something that constantly comes up in the world of design, whether one is dealing with two or three dimensions. So here you have four works by Mies van der Rohe. Here's Mies. A house, a post office, a museum, and a gas station. But while they are radically different programs, each with very different functional requirements, they're essentially variations on a theme. Some might compare Mies van der Rohe to Vivaldi. He composed one great sonata and just kept writing it down in different ways. Yet my undergraduate experience, the aphorism first stated by Louis Sullivan that form follows function was repeated ad nauseum, shoved in my face, rammed down my throat, and these violent metaphors are purposely chosen, <clears throat> which, and this is kind of in brackets, which of course causes me to recall an anecdote about the infamous but short-lived architecture program created by Colin Rowe and Bernard Hoseley at the University of Texas in Austin at, in 1951. Hoseley uh, asked what ideas their curriculum should include when teaching their first year students, and Colin, Colin Rowe replied, quote, why my good man, whatever you want them to reject later on. If the form were truly a product of the function, a house would not look the same as a gas station or a museum or, or a post office. But here you have Mies van der Rohe, the great modernist, functionist, or sorry, functional architect, doing something that's contrary to the values ascribed to him. This was something that dawned on me in my undergraduate education. Must, Mies must have been searching for something else. Whatever truths Mies sought to explore via his designs, each project was a refinement towards that truth rather than a conclusion. Pursue the irrelevant. I have two faculty members in my undergraduate education who worked against the grain. And I just found out actually one of them just passed away uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, both Peter Forster and Rory Fonseca would stress that there's more to architecture than getting the garbage out and flushing the toilets. If we truly want to reduce life to the banalities of function, then we really should be concerning ourselves with bodily functions. And what's more functional than shitting and fucking? These words are vulgar, but that's because their vulgarity is equal to the reductivist attitude that they display. They sap joy from life and reduce living to mere technique. Functionalist doctrine, doctrine doesn't give a rat's ass about human existence. It has no use for culture or cultural practice. It doesn't respect the human need for distinct, distinct experiences or practices contributions via its disciplinary specificity. Basically, you know, you've heard, you've heard that comment that money, um, uh, money uh, f flattens distinctions or, or uh, money, uh, anybody can be bought. And uh, that's the equivalent to a, a functionalist attitude that um, uh, anything has a value, anything has a monetary value. Um, it doesn't care what, uh, um, what somebody's personal values um, uh, might bear on their practice. So as an educator, I can't dictate a respect for pleasure or specify the necessity to play, nor can I command that culture and history be a part of a designer's concerns. All I can do is provide an environment where these aspects of life are included for discussion. And so again, realization comes back to language. The ability to appreciate something different comes back to understanding that language shapes our practices. So if you'll bear with me, I have two passages um, that I want to read from. 
Uh, one's a little bit later. Uh, so I want to read a passage from Michel Foucault's The Order of Things that when I first read as, an undergrad, as, a, as a student at Rice, I was dumbfounded. The passage is from uh, the preface, and it's rather well known. So I'll quote. This book, is, this book first arose out of a passage of, in Borges, out of the laughter that shattered as I read the passage, all familiar landmarks of my thought, our thought, the thought that bears the stamp of our age and our geography, breaking up all the ordered surfaces and all the planes that which, we, sorry, and all the planes with which we are accustomed to tame the wild profusion of existing things, and continuing long afterwards to, to disturb and threaten with collapse our age-old distinction between the same and the other. This passage quotes a certain Chinese encyclopedia in which it's written that, quote, animals are divided into A, belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed, C, tame, D, suckling pigs, E, sirens, F, fabulous, G, stray dogs, H, included in the present classification, I, frenzied, J, innumerable, K, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, L, etc. M, having just broken the water pitcher, and N, uh, that, form a long, that from a long way off look like flies. End quote. That's from Borges. In the wonderment of this taxonomy, the thing we apprehend in one great leap, and this is now back to Foucault, in the wonderment of this taxonomy, the thing we apprehend in one great leap, the thing that by means of the fable is demonstrated as exotic charm of another system of thought, is the limitation of our own, the stark impossibility of thinking that. So basically, uh, uh, Foucault is telling us that it's impossible, we just can't comprehend, can't comprehend thinking outside of our, ourselves. Foucault's revelation that he could not comprehend ordering or seeing the world in a manner, in the manner by which he, he, he found described in Borges' passage, pointed out to him that his own perspective was shaped how discourse was received or in the case of a student, how one is taught. Given that we gravitate towards satisfying the utilitarian expectations of a project, which at the time for me was an architectural context, what happens when we rethink that functional or utilitarian need? What happens, for instance, when the main focus of designing a gas station is not to provide gas, but to provide a platform for the staging of Oklahoma? A Broadway musical is irrelevant to the program of a gas station, but for the purposes of investigation, for an analysis which acts us to determine just why it's th these things are irrelevant, the promise of rethinking that inactivity is priceless. It's in these moments of institutional weakness when you have to make observations about why things are the way they are that originality presents itself. The relationship between the accepted convention and the marginalized experiment is in fact an opportunity to cut the ties that bind convention to its final product. Writing in 1983, architect Bernard Schumi described assigning architecture students texts by Borges, Calvino, Hess, Kafka, and Joyce, which provided programs on which students were to develop architectural works. And this is another quote, sorry. Uh, but this is quoting from Bernard Schumi uh, describing the, these assignments he would give students. The role of the text was fun fundamental in that it underlined some aspect of complementing, or occasionally lack of complementing, events and spaces. The complexities of Joyce and other writers obviously could not always be matched by their architectural projections, by visual parallels to their transpositions, derivations, or oppositions. So what he's saying there is, even though he would assign, say, you know, here's your program, go read a piece of Joyce, or go read this story by Borges, the students would come up with things that would be impossible. It, it just, they couldn't match um, in architecture any, some kind of equivalent to that um, uh, 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 literary narrative. But at the same time, he found it interesting that there were potential opportunities that did present themselves that otherwise would have gone unnoticed. So he continues, to what extent uh, could they, uh, sorry, but the effect of such research was invaluable in providing a framework for the analysis of the relations between events and spaces beyond the usual functionalist or mechanistic notions. To what extent could the literary narrative provide light on the organization of events and buildings? And here I would, this is me talking now, here I would rephrase Shumi's words as to what extent could the literary narrative provide light on the organization of events and graphic design? Whether that, uh, uh, 
words such as use, functions, activities, or ultimately programs uh, could be investigated. If writers could manipulate the structures of stories in the way that they twist vocabulary and grammar, couldn't architects do the same, organizing the program in a similarly objective, detached, or imaginative way? So Shumi's turn to literature allowed him to the freedom to reject the accepted norms of how, for, sorry, the accepted norms uh, for how language was used in architecture. Once he understood what the new point of view provided, he was able to conceive of new ways to approach his own practice. So this is just some of his work. So he's looking at literature uh, as inspiration and how that potentially could affect um, architecture. And what he conceived of is, is almost a filmic approach to architecture. He started diagramming, producing these diagrams that record different uh, events in time uh, on paper. Uh, so this project's from uh, 76 to 81, uh, the Manhattan transcripts. Uh, and then this kind of notational uh, exploration of program needs of a project allowed him to kind of further his own practice, which led to uh, him winning the competition for the La Villette Park in Paris. Uh, and you see here a, a filmic approach to programming out the park. R literally, it's like a storyboard. And this is what that looks like. The examples I'm showing here uh, come from Shumi's Manhattan transcripts in which Shumi uh, attempts to conceive of a way to diagram three different experiences in an almost filmic manner. Five years later, Shumi applied what he learned about dividing programmatic requirements into discrete experiences for his winning entry for the competition to design the Parc de La Villette in Paris. If you go to Paris, La Villette's actually one of the few parks you can walk on the grass. Uh, Shumi sought to see architecture through the lens of another discipline, and his ability to conceptualize architectural experiences in a new way led to his almost reimagined, almost filmic approach to architectural design. And by the way, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think it's any small, um, indication of how groundbreaking this was, was uh, two of his students, one of them happened to be Rem Koolhaas and the other one happened to be Zaha Hadid. Uh, those are two of his former students. And, and, which is kind of ironic because Rem Koolhaas and Bernard Schimmer are exactly the same age. Point number five. Oh, it should be four, sorry. Old slide. Oh no, uh, yeah, it's old slide, sorry. I mean, old number but it should be four. Underst understand what you're interested in and pursue it further. One of the reasons students come to Cranbrook is to determine their voice, whether that's in art, design, craft, or architecture. It's something we think about can't, but can't really force. It doesn't work that way. One's vision unfolds over time, and in truth, it makes the appearance while we're not looking for it. And when I discuss voice, I'm not simply referring to a visual style. A voice is a reflection of an attitude, a belief system, and an individual. A voice salvages an artistic design or craft work from the anonymous, mind-numbing consumer experience that we're presented with every moment of our lives. While a voice does not happen overnight, it is possible to search for a voice in, in motion to overcome an inertia. We all tend to... Um, we all tend to gravitate to our uh, certain choices in literature or movies or music. So I'll often ask my students what literature they like to read, what movies they seek out. After a few moments, a pattern usually starts to emerge. Genres start to reveal themselves. Genres are important because they tend to reflect defined parameters. While a genre can be expanded or reinvented, it will have, it will, um, it will continue to have identifiable characteristics that be, can be used to learn more about ourselves. For example, given two collections of paint samples, and this is again an example I use it in, in my classroom, given two collections of paint samples, each collection consists of 30 colors. Each collection is bound using a wire binding method. Both sample chips are made by the Dutch Sickens Paint Company. One collection is by the architect Richard Meyer and the other is by the architect Rem Koolhaas. So this is the Richard Meyer book. I don't, this, this slide might be kind of blown out. Yeah, it's a little bit blown out. Um, and this is his 30 colors. Uh, the collection by Richard Meyer consists of 30 square paint chips. Uh, it comes out in a leprolo, like the, it's gate folded twice on either side. Um, it's 30 square paint chips, each titled a Meyer white with a corresponding number assigned from one to 30. 
The collection by Rem Koolhaas is considerably different. Koolhaas's collection of colors was selected by staff working in his various offices. The Koolhaas colors are given an identifying label made from the initials of the person selecting the color, and each color is also given a name, such as moist spray, the phoenix from the ashes, meniscus. Sometimes the color is not even the intent. For example, there's one called extreme texture rather than color. This one here is called milky pink. They have a picture there of the designer who selected the color. So when I ask students to describe the kind of architecture the respective firms might produce based solely on observations about the way they handle these color chip books, students are always quite accurate. Meyer is interpreted as a top-down aesthete whose work is awash in cultured subtlety. They recognize that the work will be refined, detail-oriented, and almost precious. The students surmise that Koolhaas's firm's work will be brash, adventurous, and certainly not subtle. They observe that because the colors are selected by 24 individuals besides Koolhaas himself, it'd be impossible to produce a single unified point of view, or that perhaps the cacophony of color choices is in fact the unifying aspect to the work. And again, they're quite right about Koolhaas's work. It's definitely in your face. So it's, it's a small step then to, to extend this way of thinking to ask st students to identify the parameters which define genres in their own interests and from there to discuss how they can extend that recognition to their own work and where they want to take their practice. Okay, this is now in step, this is point five. Looking is not the same as seeing. Literature is very useful when it comes to affecting how to speak about altering perceptions. The purpose of literature is to create worlds that we can inhabit. We are accustomed to the conventions of language, so when an author consciously upsets those norms, we take note. Uh, I'd like to read a spe specific passage uh, that I often make use of in class. So this, is, this one is a little bit long, so just bear with me, because I, I, it's purposely long, cause, uh, what I need you guys, what I need to point out. Where now? Who now, when now, unquestioning I, say I, unbelieving questions, hypotheses, call them that, keep going, going on, call that going, call that on. Can it be that one day off it goes on, that one day I simply stayed in, in where, instead of going out, in the old way, out to spend the day and night as far as possible, it wasn't far? Perhaps that is how it began. You think you're simply resting, the better to act when the time comes, or for no reason, you, so you soon find yourself powerless to ever do anything again. No matter how it happened, it say it, not knowing what, perhaps I simply assented to, to, at last to an old thing, but I did nothing. I seemed to speak. It is not I, about me, it is not about me. These few general remarks to begin with, what am I to do? What shall I do? What should I do? In my situation, how proceed? By aporia, pure and simple, or by affirmations and negations, invalidated as uttered, or sooner or later? Generally speaking, there must be other shifts. Otherwise, it would be quite hopeless, but it, it is, but it is quite hopeless. I should mention before any further, any further on that I say aporia without knowing what it means. Can one be aesthetic otherwise than other unawares? I don't know. With the yeses and the noes, it is different. They will come back to me as I go along now like a bird to shit on them with all ex exception. The fact would seem to me in my situation, one may speak of facts. Not only shall I have to speak of things of which I sh cannot speak, but also, which is even more interesting, that I shall have to. I forget, no matter. And at the same time, and I, I am obliged to speak. Never shall I be silent. Never. This passage is the first page of Samuel Beckett's novel, The Unnameable, which in turn is the last book in a trilogy that begins with Malloy and Malone dies. If you, any. If you haven't read them, they're fabulous. Um, I, they're, it, it's kind of like reading Proust on drugs. Um, basically, it's uh, all, uh, the, the, what's, I'm a, I'm, a for, I'm a formalist, and I have no problems admitting that. I'm, I'm a formalist and a stylist in a lot of ways. So if you pay, when you're reading, you actually, if you're paying attention to the language and how it's written, it's just fascinating because the three novels, the narrative, dis, it disintegrates as much as the body disintegrates. So by the time you get to the, the third book, the body has disintegrated to such a point that it actually the, the unnameable 
is described as a brain in a jar sitting on a shelf watching the world go by because his body has disintegrated. And so you're actually kind of reading and thinking the same way that the body is kind of undergoing this transformation. So it's a wonderful trilogy to read. But anyway, um, the passage is without paragraph breaks. It's one continuous monologue. It, it is useful because what better way is there to make someone hyper aware of words than to purposely misuse them? Beckett himself claimed that he wrote in French because it was easier to write without style. He was not trying to be elegant. This was Beckett's attempt to de at de-skilling, to, uh, to strip writing of polish. His original French writing was translated into English with substantial changes. By writing in a foreign language, Beckett thrust himself and his reader into a new context. When I read the passage, this is the part that's key, when I read the passage, I purposely pay attention to the cadence, the cadence, the rhythm of the words, how long, how short, when the pauses occur, when the full stops occur, sentences stop, start, and stutter along. A string of one-syllable words is interrupted by a word with three or more syllables, causing an immediate and almost comical traffic jam of the tongue. Beckett purposely sprinkles in a few academic terms like aporia and ephetic, which have the effect of splashing cold water on us to make us to wake us from our trance by language before we once again grow accustomed to his sounds. So this is what I mean by I'm a stylist. I am, when I'm reading this to the students and I'm purposely you know, trying to give them something they're unfamiliar with, it goes back to look at how long the words are, look at how they're placed next to each other, and then how you kind of, at what point does he make certain changes. So they become very kind of hyper aware of, of um, uh, what, they're, what they're doing in their own work. So I finally am getting around to some graphic design. The example I'm using here is a is actually not this one. It's next. I just realized I should have had the slides reversed. But it's um, it's a recently published book by the French artist Laurence Ejeter, uh, Cathedrals. That's the one there. That's the recently published one. Cathedrals is a series of photograph photographs based on a page showing the Bourges Cathedral Goth Cathedral's Gothic facade from a book published in 1949 by the French Ministry of Tourism. So that's actually the one on the left, is the French Ministry of Tourism book that's 1949, and uh, Laurence uh, Ejeter's is uh, 2014. Ejeter photographed this image 120 times, every minute for two hours. The shadow on the window of the window frame in her studio gradually covers the reproduction until everything vanishes in the dark. Ejeter's photographs reposition a single spread from a book to breathe life into the image. A photograph stills life. It captures a moment for eternity, but by re-photographing a photograph over a changing time, Ejeter reminds us of the simple beauty of passing time. The photograph is alive while the shadow of time has been captured and made still. Like Beckett's treatment of language, Ejeter has made photography strange, necessitating our closer examination. I titled this talk, Try Again, Fail Again, Fail Better, or Thoughts on an Ongoing Dissatisfaction with the Limits of Language, yet I showed very little graphic design work and none of it was mine. <coughs> it's true that a few months ago, after 10 years of work, Emma Gray released my typeface Cardia, and I haven't include that, included any of that in this talk, but really uh, there's an essay on, pro on the process of designing Cardia, which is uh, Rudy put up on the website, which is there if, if you're, you know, want to uh, 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 if you know more about it, but I, I haven't included it here. But rather than a dog and pony show about, uh, about projects, I took a chance and felt it was more important to present a talk to a Cranbrook audience about how I came to think the way I do and how that thought structures actions behind the scenes, as it were. I thought that was kind of for the Cranbrook, the 2D students, I thought that would put them in a better understanding of, you know, because I only, I, I like, I'm coming down once a month, so I thought this would be more useful in a way. Um, if I've done my job right, then I've been able to teach others how to see and how they're to, to see their own practice. Um, so I have to actually a, a few things that, I, a few products I'd like to show of that engagement. Some of them you might be familiar with. So this is a video um, view full screen. Okay. 
So, um, I'm going for a little, I actually went a lot faster than I, did I talk too fast? I typed, okay. Um, I have a few, uh, uh, these are actually student projects that I wanted to show you. So, this is what I mean by now, I've put the students through that kind of rig rigmarole and that questioning of language and getting them to examine language. And so this is kind of like, this is like now the byproducts of that. So um, this is a Mark Ocon who uh, he went to work under Eric Cruz um, for a uh, summer and then about two years ago Eric left Wyden Kennedy Tokyo and now Mark has taken over his spot. So um, what I was sure if I should interrupt it when I was doing it but what is what kind of what's going on in a lot of ways that you know I'm looking at the form you know, the, the, the man and the woman, the composer and, you know, the woman, they don't appear in the same frame ever until the end. Like, there are moments that are consciously designed to kind of, because he's looking at storytelling and I've brought his attention how language shapes the narrative. So he's looking at then how the visuals shape the narrative. There are moments that are, he's reusing footage that was at the beginning, at the end, to kind of like tie it up in a bow, bring you back to the memory that you initially, the memory experience that you earlier had. So you kind of get a warm, fuzzy feeling because, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Um, the camera doesn't reveal the, the you know, until the, he's built up some tension about, you want to know more about this character. So he caresses the arm going down with the camera of the composer. Uh, and then you start to get more glimpses of who this composer is, but you don't see the face yet until again at the end when it's revealed with you know the, the man and the woman in the same frame. Um, let's see here. And then in terms of technique, um, because this composer is Japanese, um, this is well, the technique was. Uh, um, basically based on fucking up in Photoshop. So, um, Mark uh, worked on this video for one, for the whole year, and um, 
he wanted it to reflect Japanese pop culture. So looking at some of the coloration that, that you get in Japanese pop culture um, and um, some of the uh, anime type, like, there you go, some of the animation that you get in Japanese pop culture. So that influenced kind of the color choices, the mood, pacing settings for the edits. Um, uh, and all of these things are being folded in really kind of in a very methodical way. Um, and it, like I said, it, this it was a whatever three minute video, or whatever, no, a minute and a half, I think, two minutes? Two minutes, 43 seconds. It took him the whole year. Um, but every decision is very conscious because he's been made hyper aware. Um, Sarah Swiner, same thing. This is actually her second book. I should have shown you this. This is the second book that she did. Um, and uh, she's looking at, po this is a, uh, I should have shown you, I'll show you the first one because it'll make more sense. But she's looking at pop culture and actually kitsch culture um, and reading Mi Milan Kundera. So, he, you know, there's an interest in just even the, the level of the typeface, cheesy 70s font and this kind of sickly postcard um, visual uh, references. And then the encyclopedia begins, and it's all this kind of nonsense, not, I wouldn't say nonsense, but um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, it's not exactly the most rational encyclopedia, let's put it that way. And this actually became a kick, she was funded by a Kickstarter campaign, so it's been actually pu been published. Um, so that was a textbook. Her second book then was the equivalent um, in terms of uh, uh, understanding narrative. That one was a base, uh, text based. This is now image based. So it still has that kind of uh, absurdist sensibility and uh, there's a bit of nostalgia um, for kitsch. But again, my point is that these designers, like these students are very much hyper aware and hyper in control of the craft of both the image crafting and the language crafting. You know, their interest more than mine, their interest, I mean, not, not that it's more than mine, but their interest is very much in the image craft. Um, and I kind of lean both ways in terms of the language crafting because they don't really write. You know, neither Sarah nor Mark writes, but um, that's more of an interest of mine. Right, here's another student who, um, I, sorry, I should have done it. Um, page, there we go. Uh, this student was looking at suburban culture. And these were large posters and then after that it was pr put together in, in a book format, a large book format. And they looked at the kind of, she's trying to tread a fine line between the, um, uh, the kind of uh, kitsch visual language and uh, slogans that one, is a, that one kind of come, that pops to mind. So she was looking at consumer culture fast food diets, building status, privacy versus surveillance, suburbia as a monument, car dependency, homogeneity, uh, representations of the self, stereotypes of the home. So there's two dialogues going on. There's actually the poster there and then there's kind of the more biting title And of course, you guys are familiar with. Anton. And this is actually a, um, the student was looking at also wanting to look at ornament uh, ornamentation, but ornament uh, in, in a very unusual setting. High end, he, he looked at, he was looking at the, the kind of clash between literature and um, uh, a kind of a vernacular. Um, so it was very odd to then recast Ulysses in this hand typography. This is the guy that I think should come here. For 
And this was actually quite difficult because he's working in layers with um, the, 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 the type is actually not on the same layer as the elements behind it. They actually had to be designed separately and then they had to line up with the um, text settings. So it looks actually, it's like very straightforward, but this was very not very straightforward project. You know, to do this kind of thing with the uh, pull quote, this stuff is very, very difficult for him. And then it, it slowly bleeds into a different voice as the voice changes in the book. And it goes, it becomes kind of like mind numbing on purpose because you become overwhelmed. And that's a reflection of the actual content of the book itself. So um, I finished earlier than I thought. I was trying to pace myself, but I finished earlier. Than I thought. So that was my talk. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything? Or? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, one of my favorite courses that I took at Princeton was uh, literary history and literary modernity. So I gravitate towards the, you know, like Virginia Woolf, Proust, um, Conrad, Borges, um, Fuentes. Um, what else? Joyce, obviously, you know, another, another amazing book, uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, because it's one of those books where he writes, it, 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 you, he, as he ages, the narrative style changes, right? So he thinks, when you're reading it, he thinks like a 16-year-old in the first chapter. And then you move to the next chapter, and he thinks, and he writes. This is what's amazing, is he's writing, they're reading his thoughts as a 20-year-old, and then it's in, as a 24. So like as the book progresses, the writing changes, which is, it's mine, and it's a good story, but then it's like that, that kind of like, how do you do that as a writer is just amazing to me. But it's, um, you know, when you're, we, you, it's, I find it interesting that you, when you are in, like the students don't know a lot of this stuff too. Like I subject you guys to kind of like, like I, I, I think of teaching as kind of like, it's like an experiment, you know? Um, so you kind of throw something in the mix and you see what happens. And usually you guys come up with amazing stuff that you would never expected the student to come up with, but you guys don't know that it was an experiment. So that's kind of, you know, I, it, that's what happens, I guess. I got off topic, sorry. Yeah. Sure, um, I think it's like this is, that's what I said, it's like I don't feel the need, I don't feel it would be Im good to impose this on somebody else. And I'm not saying this because I have the freedom to say it because I'm teaching. Um, I am, I, how to say this, um, there is a lot of good work that is corporate, that is utilitarian. There's a lot of good work that does social, you know, awareness. My biggest, like my, my kind of, uh, you know, railing against the windmills kind of thing is that the other part of it, like the thing, the interests that I have, have become so diminished and so disregarded. Like in, I teach at a public institution and so it is all about producing reports now and kind of justifications with learning outcomes and like all that stuff because that is the new norm. We have to prove that we're doing a good job. So rather than actually doing our job, we have to write, we spend our time proving that we're doing a good job. Like one of the reasons I don't have a huge practice, which is why I'm, I'm very embarrassed about the fact is like, I get, I'm known at York to get things done. 
And so, you know, those that can do things are rewarded by being more crap is dumped on them. And those that are incompetent are rewarded with freedom to not do even, to do even less. Um, so like I, I, I recognize that it's not, it's not, I'm not going to change the world. I just more like, I just wish there was more of a, I'll say this like a wedge or a space for that other kind of cultural aspect to graphic design. Um, most students, if you talk to them, most students get into graphic design because they had some kind of artistic bent when they were in high school. They didn't actually get into it because they wanted to save the world, you know, but it's, which is fine. Um, but then they kind of get into their programs and the program is all about social awareness and they come out of it, it's like, well, that's what graphic designers do. You gotta be socially aware. It's like, okay, you know, like that's to me, that's the, the bigger problem is it's kind of, it's, it's spirit crushing otherwise. Um, but it's just more like I get, I now I'm getting to the point where I get to be that old crank that, you know, talks about the good old days. Um, but that's, you know, that's the reality. Like it bugs the hell out of me, like visible language, the journal. Um, they are totally now, they've switched, they, they're, 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 their editorial con direction has changed and they're, because they changed editors and Mike Zender, and I told him this, I'm not, I'm not happy with it. Um, so it's not like I'm saying something that he doesn't know, but um, they only want to publish um, essays that deal in, uh, you know, what he considers research. So, you know, medical sciences, social sciences, um, uh, the hard sciences, natural sciences, anything that basically the, re the kind of uh, topic or the outcomes can be uh, verified by, a, you know, third party, that kind of thing. And it's a shame because the cultural essays, they're not interested in publishing anymore. So it's, it's not like I have a, I think that stuff is bad. It's just, I think that there's, it's become the norm, but it's not necessarily the best norm out there. I, I always say like, you know, all the public school, like you guys are paying a lot in tuition, but all the, the best schools will continue to produce the work that they are doing. They will be the art directors and the rest of us will basically be um, supplying the kind of CAD monkeys, you know, like the, the Photoshop monkeys that will just be working on the software because <clears throat> you guys get to actually work on conceptual issues. You guys get to work on deep topics and the rest of us are being pressured to produce posters that you know are about global warming because that's what's expected or we're expected to produce apps that will, uh, we can go to a third party, uh, Sanyo or whatever and you know, get some, um, research dollars, and so I just think that it's a shame, but that's the reality. So you're, you're lucky to be here. Yep. I'll be blunt, it's the biggest regret of my life. Unfortunately, I was stupid to change. I should have stayed in architecture because when I switched, I was 32 and I couldn't get work as a graphic designer because everybody, you won't have this problem, but everybody when I went to work uh, to look for work was a, all the art directors were about 10 years younger than I was. So I couldn't get work. Um, and then there was, I did get a job, you know, finally and 9-11 um, uh, uh, happened like three months after I graduated or whatever. And um, that was that basically. Uh, the reason I went back to get additional master's degrees was because I couldn't pay my student loans and I had to defer them somehow. So one way to do that was to go back to school. Um, I recognize, like I'm a, it's one of my frustrations because I don't, I, I have a background from a school that's steeped in discourse uh, but none of my colleagues do. So I'm very much the odd person out at York. But that, you know, I, I, the best job I ever had, actually this is gonna, I think gonna be up there as well, 
best job I ever had in my life was the semester I taught at CalArts because um, uh, the people that were there, the you know like Jeff Keady and Ed Stella and whatnot, they came from Cranbrook, and so at least there was an understanding of, of graphic design as a form of cultural production. It's not about like you know. Uh, graphic design is a, me is a form of social science and you know it's an opportunity to get a large research grant that, which is fine but not for me um, so uh, I unfortunately I am where I am and um, so I don't think you'd be you know I don't think your situation would be the same you knew it sounds like literally today you knew more about um, uh, typography uh, than I did when I was here um, you know, and uh, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't know hardly anything. Um, and I kind of didn't have the greatest because of the situation of, you know, uh, Scott Makula died about a, uh, a month, bef whatever, two months before classes started here. So it was not a very good time to be here in a lot of ways. So I, I think you're already on the ball and there are tons more, um, you know, but it, it was, for me, it was being 32 and trying to find work in New York was not easy um, when everybody else is, as soon as I walked in the door, they, they, they saw how old I was. And, and the reason I went into teaching was because it's the one place I had teaching experience in architecture. So they, the age people, the age thing, uh, universities didn't hold it against me. Uh, that, that was the only reason I went into teaching. I loved practice when I did it, um, but I couldn't find the work and uh, so, I went into teaching because it was one of the few places that I could get a job. Which is totally stupid, but oh well. I'm just very honest, like, you know. <laughs> what do you want me to say? You know, everybody, uh, you know, like, uh, um, you know that, that episode on, um, on Friends where, where Joey is really depressed and then and, and Phoebe brings that, that Irish setter that's really happy and leaves him with, with Joey? And then she comes back at the end of the day and the dog's really mopey and, and, and um, Phoebe says, you broke the dog? <laughs> I, I can make anybody, anybody, you know, think that the glass is half full. I can make anybody a, a pessimist. Well, it's, uh, it, you know, you, there's a thesis book. Um, I, I, my father died uh, three weeks before grad show, which is why my thesis book really is like, the, is four words long. Uh, I couldn't write, I couldn't do anything. So um, there's not much else in there. I mean, there's slides and stuff. My first, there's no, I don't think there's any of my first year work in my thesis book. It was just my second, some of my second year work, and even that I'm embarrassed by. Probably the most um, interesting thing in there was uh, I tried to do a text, a text font, um, which was interesting because at the time, um, Mike Essel, I think, wanted to punch my face out. Because like, it was like, how dare you do a text face at Cranbrook? Um, that was a very interesting crit because I think he was gonna, he really wanted to punch me. Um, but yeah, that, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, I was doing a book for Lori. Um, there was a lot of uh, quake going on when I was here. <laughs> and so I was working in Lori's studio and I come back because I needed something from my studio space. And um, I was you know, going nuts because uh, I was kind of on my own to make that book. And there's a lot of quake going on in the studio. And so I sat down, you know, made a poster that said, fuck your free time, printed it out, and then hung it up in my space and then went back, um, which I think is in my thesis book. Um, it, was, it was stressful for me for a lot of reasons. Uh, it wasn't, it was, it was, it's a different, it was a different experience than what you're getting now. Let's put it that way. It was a very different experience than what you guys are having. You guys are getting a very rigorous and a very thorough education. And uh, it, I, through matters of circumstance, it didn't work out that way for me here.
I buy that. I think there is no, I mean, I know Elliot said this, there is no um, form is a, a form of content and you can't really talk about graphic design um, without a message being involved. I mean, there's, there's something visual there, whether it's type or it's image. So yeah, no, I, I would I totally agree with that, that um, uh, the form actually does contribute and, and it's part of its function and uh, it also works, it works even against the grain with the utilitarian function um, or with the grain. Um, I mean, that's part of the magic of architecture as well, that if it doesn't work, like it doesn't, it, you know, if it doesn't function as well, that um, it's not probably not the best architecture. Like some of the best stuff out there does both well. So um, I think that is part of, of um, architecture in general. Um, you know, like the best building I've ever been in is the Kimball Art Museum in Dallas. And it, it functions, does everything it needs to do, and it's just amazing space to be in. You know, or um, the other best museum I've ever been to, the Menil in Houston. Um, what's just fabulous about that building is uh, often you'll go there and there's no, the lights, the electric lights are off because they get so much natural light in through the, the kind of concrete louvers. And then a cloud or even a plane goes over the sun, like between, you know, the shadow from a plane goes over. And for a split second, the room goes, woo, woo, you know, like in terms of the light conditions. And it's just wonderful to be in a museum where that's happening, where it's just that you're kind of already, you're so connected to the outside, even though you're totally with inside. And the louvers, the, the concrete louvers in the Menil, you can't see out the ceiling. Like the angle is in such a way that you can't actually see the sky. So when the light changes, you don't know what caused it, but it's just a, a fabulous place. And it functions, it's a great museum. Uh, great space, both spiritually and um, uh, you know functionally, is is wonderful. So I I, I have no problem saying that that yeah, um, I'm part of that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss the utilitarian. Like I wouldn't dismiss it entirely. To me, again, that's like me being dismissive of, uh, I, I'm kind of then at that, if I'm dismissive in that sense, then that's the equivalent to what I'm critiquing, you know, criticizing, which is like vi you know, visual language, not offering a space for that kind of um, literary or cultural uh, uh, appreciation. So if I'm, if I take the position that really I'm putting the story entirely above the utilitarian, then to me that's also kind of just equally guilty of, of kind of uh, turning a blind eye. So I, 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 you know, and there's nothing wrong with saying that function is necess uh, necessary or that it's a part of, you know, that's what makes this stuff really amazing is like they were able to solve this problem and they did it uh, in a beautiful way. Oh yeah, sorry. What other, sorry? I have an MA in typeface design from Reading and an MA in design writing criticism from LC London College of Communication. Um, it's actually really embarrassing to have that many MAs <laughs> because um, you know, if I didn't need one, I mean, Elliot has one master's, yes, and he's the head of Cranbrook, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, let's say, let's, let's be, look, you can look at it the other way, you know what? Like, basically, I, I fucked up three times to get the, you know, the fourth master, like, that kind of thing. Like, you can look at it that way. I didn't get a PhD, I got another master's. So, um, it's not something I really am that proud of. It's more of like a statement of fact to me rather than something that I am proud of to be honest, because I can't get around it because it's there, but you know, I, I, it's not something that I'm really crazy about because if I was smart, I really only needed one. Anybody? Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you.